everybody, welcome to the second episode of Morville Orville, uh, the show that reviews episodes of The Orville. I'm your co-host, Mike L. I am joined by G.I. Jolie. Hi, I'm G.I. Jolie. Woo! And also, <laughs> Champion. Hi, Mike. Hi, Jolie. It's great to be back again. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, last week we reviewed episode one. This week we're up reviewing episode two of the show. Um, this one's called Command Performance. Again, written by Seth MacFarlane. Obviously a passion project. I mean, say what you will about his comedy, but I don't know. I think he's surprisingly good at writing, you know, drama, science fiction, Twilight Zone-esque plots, um, which we'll talk about more as the show goes on. But so far, I'm a big fan of his writing. Um, I guess, I, let's just start off by asking, were you guys surprised at how good he is at writing this stuff? A little. A little. Yeah. Especially early also, on. Also, very shocked. Yeah. Like, in the show, at, you know, which we'll get into more with season two, but season two gets really real. And uh, it's almost like if, it, if, if the quality of the show would have stayed what it was in season one, I would have been fine. But the fact that it ramps up in season two, it's a, it's a welcome improvement, right? I remember one or two occasions watching season two when, after finishing an episode, I had to get on uh, Messenger right away and say, Hey, Mike, um, what did you think of this episode? Right? Like, I had right. to talk about it, which right. doesn't happen very often. Right, right. So, yeah, so this uh, second episode of your command performance, I guess, to me, this is a classic sci-fi type episode. It reminds me a little bit of an episode of uh, The Twilight Zone. Which actually, I don't know if you guys... Are you guys fans of The Twilight Zone? Absolutely. Ian, uh, G.I. Jolie, are you familiar with the original Twilight Zone? Not very, but that's because I'm a scaredy cat. <laughs> it is a creepy show. It is a creepy show. Uh, a friend of ours, uh, our online friend, Cousin Brandon, he's a huge fan of Twilight Zone. He's obsessed with it. So maybe he'd be uh, good to have as a guest on the show. But uh, there is an episode of Twilight Zone that ends with two humans... I think what happens is the whole episode, it's, you know, they can't figure out what's going on. And then when the episode ends, it sort of pans out and you realize that they're actually in a zoo on an alien world. Right. Which ends up. Do you know what the episode's called? Not sure. If, I'm sure if you went Twilight Zone Human Zoo or something, you could easily find it. But while G.I. Jolie is Googling that, Champion, can you briefly summarize the plot of this episode? Well, this is a fairly simple, simple episode and a bit of a callback to um, the very first Star Trek episode ever, uh, the original series, The Menagerie. Yes. And well, the in cage, this the episode, oh, the, oh, sorry. Yes, The Cage. The, the Menagerie was um, the sort of the, the two part rework episode where right. they essentially found a way to use all that footage again. Right. <laughs> but in this episode, um, uh, Ed and Kelly, uh, they leave the ship to um they they uh they stumble across a ship in distress and they go over to um assess the situation uh ed's parents are on board which uh, gets their guard down they board this ship only to find that it's not a ship at all it is uh an alien device that whisks them away and uh the orville is left in command of uh uh, the uh, the young chief of security, uh, uh, Katan, or what's her what's her name? Alara, 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 and uh, Alara is immediately out of her depth. She has no idea what she's doing, and she's forced to problem solve and uh, working without a net for the very first time. She um, messes everything up, not to put too fine a point on it. Nearly gets the ship destroyed, loses the confidence of the crew. And is ordered to abandon uh, uh, Captain Mercer and uh, and come back to Earth, which causes the crew to hate her even more. And she essentially has to make some hard decisions about whether or not she's going to follow orders or whether or not she's going to go out on a limb and risk her career and the lives of her shipmates to rescue her friends and comrades. Right. Do we want to spoil how it ends? Yeah, why Everybody not? dies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, in, in the end, uh, she uh, goes against orders and 
the uh, the captain and uh, sorry, <clears throat> Ed and Kelly are being held in this zoo by a, a, a race of aliens that looks down upon any species that is uh, intellectually inferior to them, which makes it a very dangerous mission. Is this uh, this alien race essentially uh, regards humans as uh, on the same level with insects, so they'd have no compunction to destroy them, and they um, enlist the help of Isaac, the robot who himself is a uh, is a superior intellect being that uh, they consider on the same level, and they uh, leverage him in order to trade. Ed and Kelly for uh, an even better exhibit for their zoo, which is essentially a, a USB thumb drive full of hundreds of episodes of Keeping Up with the Kardashians and various other reality trash TV shows. Right. And that's the end. See, I knew there was. I knew it was Keeping Up with the Kardashians. Right. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you did mention that in the, uh, yeah. in the previous podcast. Anyway. Thing. So here's the thing, uh, this episode... It was, it just wasn't part of the first episode. Oh. So, okay, <laughs> with this episode, I, I guess we might as well just... Let's talk about what is it, what social issue, if you want to call it that, do we think that they're referencing? I mean, to me, to me, it's the treatment of animals, right? Like, sticking these humans in a zoo because they're intellectually inferior is... Sim- and they mention it in the show. I think Kelly mentions it. You know, it's similar to the current practice of placing animals in the zoo you you know this addresses our treatment of animals um so for that i definitely appreciated it myself being pescatarian meaning i eat fish but not other animals i can definitely relate to this issue um so i thought it was an interesting exploration we also got to see you know some comedy between uh kelly and ed where in the first episode it almost or sorry at the beginning of this episode it almost seemed like oh, maybe there's a chance of them getting back together. And then they were drinking, so it's like, ooh, who knows what's going to happen, right? A little bit of sexual tension there. But then by the time they wake up in the morning, they're already sick of each other. All of their problems are coming back, right? Um, so there's some comedy there. I liked seeing the um, exploration of um, of Alara sort of having her trial of, what is that called? No, baptism of fire, right? Not feeling confident enough to command the, the ship, but she, she has to go through with it. She has to risk the crew hating her, um, and then she ends up disobeying orders and, you know, taking the ship back to rescue them. So I thought that, that was really cool. And overall, again, I mean, the ending is not quite as satisfying as episode one because it's sort of like a, a comedy, like a, like a comedic solution. But I did like the fact that they came up with something to get out of it. So once again, they have to use their wits to solve the problem. So that, that was cool. So overall, I did like this episode. Uh, G.I. Julie, what was your impression of this one? Um, to me, every I thought everything was like, um, I thought everything was perfect, super tight. Um, the whole idea behind the Calavon race being the way that they are, um, and trapping everyone, every other species pretty much in the, in the galaxy in a Calavon zoo, um, was a super interesting, uh, sort of like, plot by the way i just want to mention now that i've done the research um and the reason why i asked is because uh, about twilight zone i'm just going to tangent but it's all it's all adjacent um the episode is called children's zoo it was in the first season of twilight zone i ask because uh mm, the director for this this second episode is robert duncan mcneil who starred in several episodes of the twilight zone but is also famous for being tom paris oh oh really wow that's what, yeah so that's why i asked i was like well wouldn't you know he's in twilight zone wouldn't it be funny if his episode of twilight zone was children's zoo but it's not his episode is <laughs> something completely different it's called he played somebody in uh, a message from charity or examination day so his but his episode was still in the first season uh which children's zoo is part of but uh, wouldn't it have been just the cherry on top of a really perfect cake um so close so right close. <laughs> so so close so for me it was everything just fell into place and there's a through lines from the first episode into this episode and parts of those through lines 
carry on into the next episode, which we'll talk about in the next episode of Morville. But like, Alara Katan does exactly what I would do because she's technically not the first person they would have put in command. Commander right. Bordis, who is third in command, would have done it, except him and his husband have just hatched an egg and he needs to sit on it for 21 days. Right. <laughs> so she runs directly to his room and busts in on him naked, mm. sitting right. on his egg. Right. And it's not played for laughs. It is completely serious. He is upset that she has not knocked. Um, and he's like, you're, you're a planetary union officer. Figure it the F out. Like, get out of here. Mm. It, what if I were dead? What if they were dead? You would still be in command. Just figure it out. Right. Then she does the next best thing. Well, she does the next best thing next, uh, after what she does next. Because what she does next is pretty much destroy the ship. Um, oh, I thought you were going to say she she gets drunk next. She goes to the mm. replicator right. and grabs oh, some tequila. Oh, yeah, and gets some Salayan tequila. Um, mm. You know, I might do that. That's another... Okay. I always wondered about uh, a replicator and why people weren't just wasted all the time, like an eating chocolate cake or something. But right, uh, that's neither here nor there. Um, she she gets drunk, decides, okay, cool, I'm going to solve the problem. Can't solve the problem. Everybody is in uh, the infirmary, and that's where she stumbles on the doctor Claire Finn, who is. Uh, who is the sage of the ship and gives her advice without giving her the answer. Like, the answers. Mm -hmm. Um, Anyway, long story short, I feel, I don't feel like the solution is as, like, I don't feel like a comedic solution to the episode's problem in this case is is bad. I had no idea how they were going to get them like, uh, having Get watched this a second time I can't I could, didn't even remember what the solution was mm-hmm. and I was like wow what did she trade to them that's better than having an actual human exhibit like what could be better than <laughs> Kelly and Ed lounging around fighting like an old married couple oh I know every actual married couple on the face of the universe um in reality television show like style fighting like that is what it's like crazy it's exactly what those uh calavon it's exactly exactly what the calavons want Mm -hmm. is to be entertained by like idiots and it it was handed right to them and i think it's less about humans and their power over animals and it's more about um entertainment and voyeurism and depending on where you are in the grand scheme of things what you consider entertaining that's a good point generally that's a good point okay ian what did you think of this episode i really like this episode i think it was very strong uh start to finish it was a great character study of a uh, of a Lara, it was <clears throat> excuse me. They did a really good job of putting her in a situation where she had to think on her feet, and was completely out of her depth. And she handled it uh, with all of the fear and awkwardness that I would imagine myself handling this situation, if that's what I was in. First mm-hmm. thing I would do too is uh, run to dad. Hey, get off that egg, and uh, come help us out here. And while well, we're speaking about Bordis, at that moment, very early on, like it's, it's clear that Bordis is the wharf of the ship. And I think that uh, like even in episode two, Bordis is a better wharf than wharf oh, ever was. Oh, yes. We'll talk about that more next episode, but I agree. Yes. Butt crack mm. and all. <laughs> that was a fantastic scene, and I love the way that they played it completely straight. Yep. It was hilarious without them trying to make it hilarious. And I think that was very well done. But beyond that, um, 
it was it, it was interesting to see uh, her reactions and to see how she handled the situation by first going against the advice that she was given in an attempt to appear strong. She's yelling at her uh, at her bridge mates and um, she's she's uh, praising them for no reason. It's like she's going through these various motions, like she's she's seen a little bit about what it's like to be a captain on TV, and now she's trying to emulate it without knowing anything that goes on behind the scenes about any about anything that goes into these decisions. And it's not until Claire Finn comes and settles her down that she's able to finally learn to lean on her on her shipmates, essentially, and to trust the people that are around her, that she doesn't have to do it all herself, that everyone's there for each other. Now, when it comes to the scenes in the zoo, I, I don't I don't get so much that there's necessarily an ethical uh, message there. If there is, it's not really it's not really played as such. I think that th those scenes are more of um, uh, furthering the, our knowledge of um, Ed and Kelly and how they got to be in the situation that they are now, right? Like in the first episode. We see, like, we catch uh, we catch her in bed with a blue alien. We know that things went sideways there. And we know that they have a past, but we know very little of that past. Mm -hmm. So now we kind of, we get to see them in this zoo almost as though it's a flashback. Because they're in their old apartment and they're settling into their old habits. But it's not a flashback. But we get the same information as though it was a flashback. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was a clever, a clever use of uh, them being in the zoo there. And in terms of the, the way that they get out of the situation, that's really not important. They get out. It's a character study. They get out of the solution. They get out of the problem with whatever solution it is. And they don't play that solution up until the very, very end. Even when they're on the ship celebrating, oh, I'm really glad that we got you guys back. It's, it's as though they're, they're talking more about uh, Alara and what she's done. And they give her a medal. Mm -hmm. And they resolve that first, and then they're like, "Huh, I wonder what they gave the the." I'm sorry, I forget the red faced aliens. What what their the Calavans. species go? The Calavan. That's yes. a good point. Yep. I, I I wonder what they gave the Calavan, and then they flash over to them, and they're watching this reality TV. Like that's that's not the important part, though. The important part is uh, Alara and how she handled the situation, how she ended up uh, not only succeeding but thriving and mm -hmm. and uh, rescuing. Uh, her crewmates where she was ordered not to by the uh, fleet admiral anyway uh yeah with this episode um i don't know if there's any gags you guys want to bring up but <laughs> the part where ed and kelly are sitting there and then all of a sudden alara just appears in the window and she's like captain and it's funny because she's oh yes <laughs> she snuck up but she didn't sneak up they're just standing there and there's something about it just made me laugh out loud i don't know i thought it was so funny I don't know. So that was a, that was one of my favorite moments. Does anyone else have any other favorite moments they'd like to mention? Well, Jolie already mentioned the uh, Bordas butt crack moment. Oh, that was great. Yeah. Because they so subtly brought that up in... Uh, uh, and they, like Ian said, it was a serious moment. Um, except you're sitting nude incubating an egg. Right. So, but also, they go around him for the over-the-shoulder shot, but they expose his whole body to be nude, and there's <laughs> his butt crack. Right. It's, but no one's laughing. Alara is not alarmed by anything she sees. She's oh, she, she can, she's terrified. Yeah, she's at terrified. Situation. But also something equally terrifying is happening to her so it's like she had to choose which was more terrifying uh -huh. <laughs> and and um it was a really neat way to kind of give us a little more about bordis's culture right because you know how like with wharf speaking of um with wharf they kind of uh show you a little bit of what klingons are about here and there with like smatterings of sometimes he'll speak and then he'll sometimes he'll talk about mating rituals this one is just it's just the same where it's like we're only a little exposed to what's happening like there's only males in the species uh or males in the species at this point 
we think that males in the species incubate the egg like a bird. <laughs> and then we find out maybe not so much later. Um, mm-hmm. There wasn't too much. Uh, there were like specific, specific gags that I thought were um, uh, outside of Bordis's butt crack uh, that were like spit take sort of moments. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I will say now that I'm thinking about it a little bit more is that the the building of Ed and Kelly's relationship, the character that is their relationship with each other was probably like my favorite part of the episode. Mm-hmm. Well, not favorite, but like I liked seeing more of it uh, because it you see how like how clearly not for each other these people are but that as friends and as colleagues they can work together like very professionally um you can see that you can see because they see it they're put in this situation where they think that maybe they've been uh sucked back in time because they've dealt with time travel now Mm -hmm. um they think that maybe this is their apartment in new york and now they have to live with each other and Less than 12 hours later, they're already at each other's throats. Right, right. So um, it's, it's, it's a really, it's really fun to see their dynamic and that maybe their relationship might have deteriorated without adultery at the core. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. And then at the end of this, oh, sorry, unless Ian has any more to say about whether or not he liked this Oh, in terms of, yeah. Oh, I think it was, I think it was, I think it was a great episode. Um, I liked uh seeing jeffrey tambor at the beginning as uh as his dad as as, as, as dad right i think that was a great scene um what is he famous for (laughs) i I, arrested um, development uh, oh okay but other stuff Mm. before that though because i've never seen arrested development i don't know what he was in before that i know he's done some voice acting for archer as well okay I'm not well, super anyway. familiar yeah, I'm not, with I'm him as sure. an actor either, but yeah, I completely. But as a, as a big Arrested Development fan, as a big Arrested Development fan, it was fun to see him uh, in that role, and it was just it was a little jarring, but um, in the same way that it would have been jarring for uh, Ed to see his parents show up on the screen at all. Right, right? I think that it worked for that. Oh, I'll just quickly say he was in Injustice for All with Al Pacino, Mr. Mom. There's something about Mary, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, Hellboy, Hellboy 2, The Hangover Trilogy. So, yeah, he's been around forever. But anyway. I've seen so few of those things. Okay. (laughs) So, anyway, uh, I mean, overall, I thought it was a good episode. Maybe a slight improvement on the first one. Again, it's it's only episode two, and it's already finding its legs, I think. That's what I felt about this one. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. overall. It was less less messy tonally as well. They didn't have the nearly as many of those swings between you know slapstick and uh horrible people getting killed right right uh so let's briefly talk about every episode we're going to try and talk about one of the characters on the show this episode focuses on my favorite character which is alara um i mean there's many reasons she's my favorite character uh i won't go into all of them i'll just say that one of the things i like is playing against uh, type right like she is the youngest i believe and probably smallest stature character on the show however she is the strongest so therefore she's in charge of security right and i love i it, it's always irritated me for example when um what's her name uh when gal gadot was cast as wonder woman and everyone was like well she's gonna have to hit the gym and work out no she's actually not because she gets her strength from hercules not from you know <laughs> The bicep that's, you know, <laughs> this big that makes her be able to lift up, you know, buildings and stuff. So I just like the fact that, look, don't worry about it. She's an alien. She's stronger. Who cares? So that's one thing I really like about her. I also like how, you know, her naivete kind of plays into her character. And I don't know. She's just always been my favorite character. As Orville fans know, unfortunately, she left the cast midway through season two, which I still think was a huge mistake. But anyway, I'm a big fan of this character. Um, Ian, what about you? I am as well. Uh, she's uh, the underdog character. She's never taken seriously. 
And some of that is is shown in this episode as well. When uh, I'm not sure if it's the chief engineer, but he's um, he's the guy who's in charge of repairing the shuttle bay after she almost blows the ship up. Right, right. And he 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 refers to her as kid right. all the time. Yes. Until until she finally gets her confidence and she basically smacks him down and says, "Oh, by the way, that's Captain." Right. And then he 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 de- he defers. He's like, "Oh yeah, no, oh, sorry, sorry, Captain," but uh, she has to. Despite the fact that she's the strongest uh, member of the crew, she has to fight for her respect, not by using her strength, but by using her wits. Right. And that's something that she starts to do in this episode here. There you go. G.I. Jolie, what do you think? I uh, was... I was interested in her character. I I remember uh, talking about like the meeting of all the characters. Uh, I was interested in her character, not the least. I was interested in Lamar's character, the least. I was curious about Salayans, um, but I also was disappointed that they made like the small, tiny, um, twenty-three-year-old woman, like you know, the the badass that. Because I I always hate the characterization of badass, like the words badass and woman together. Uh-huh. Um, because it does a woman always have to be a badass for her to be taken seriously? Um, does she? And she uses the majority of episode two to prove her worth. So it, it's it was like not as vindicating enough. Because I was already disappointed in the characterization of her being uh, like this tiny Hercules uh, type of character. Um, You don't see them often, but if you get a woman character in an ensemble, yes, there's something about them um, that is not characteristic of feminine qualities that that makes them part of the crowd or you're Mm -hmm. like Buffy where you're the only slayer and you have magic powers or you are Wonder Woman and your powers come from gods. Like it's when it's not expected, it's like you have to write it in. Oh, well here's the thing. She's slaying and the gravity on their uh, planet is different from earth. So she's like Superman where the sun makes her strong. Like, you know what I mean? It's just like, there's a lot of heavy lifting for Soleil and Gravity to be doing <laughs> and <laughs> they base a whole episode out of it which I'm actually fine with because this is where I get more of her character um, in episode 2 you see and eventually we'll see even more when we go to Soleil to see her family but like um you see that she, her more of her character comes through in her uh, insecurity about herself, um, because not, strong people aren't always as confident as they come off. They're actually frequently scared and need help, and often have trouble asking for it, or they don't, um, and they scramble. And it was really, it was, it was really good to see how green she was. Um, and then for her to come into her own, it was really satisfying in this episode. Great. Um, yeah, so I really, by the end of this episode, I was sold on her character. And in my mind, I was like, all right, now they got to give Lamar and Malloy a buddy cop episode and the whole group (laughs) will come together. So there you go. Awesome. So yeah, so basically we all agree this was a great episode, right? Probably mm-hmm. best episode so far. Yeah, best episode of the entire series so far. Uh, so basically, that's it for this episode. We are going to be back with our next episode, reviewing episode three of the Orville. So thank you for joining us. You can find every episode of Morville Orville on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and the Comic Book Syndicate website. So until next time, there's more where that came from. Thank you.